I escaped to save my life, and I, it's a story that I wanted to tell. Christopher John Boyce Christopher Boyce was a U.S. intelligence community contractor with a top-secret-slash-SCI security clearance. He sold classified information to the Soviet KGB but later was caught and was sent out jail. He testified at hearings before the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations which concerns U.S. government personnel security program. He described what is really like to be a spy. All of this brings me to another point I would like to raise. I am convinced from my own experiences that what I say now is by far the most useful contribu contribution that I can make to this subcommittee's study of personnel security. While I think these security regulations you review are important to maintain the integrity of the government, I believe that they are next to worthless if each of the four million Americans with security clearances do not have a grasp of how espionage would affect them personally. No matter what security procedures are devised, if a man built it, another man can circumvent it, and usually in the most simple way. At best, physical security can only make things tougher. The increase of espionage that you are experiencing will not be a passing phase unless popular myths about espionage are debunked for the fraud they are. I think even in these responsible times that have not carefully monitored, the intelligence community of any Western nation can be potentially a threat to an open society. But there is nothing potential about the KGB. That state apparatus not only threatens every open society, but it crushes open societies. That is the distinction that I could not see at a rebellious 21. And it is a distinction that which Americans must see. The security organizations of both sides spy and engage in clandestine tactics. And in Mr. Gorbachev's new age of Camelot at the Kremlin, it will be easier for naive Americans to rationalize away the distinction between the restrained secrecy that defends them and the menace that seeks to deceive them. By your own estimates, there are at least 500 KGB agents in the United States. And senators, I respectfully suggest that the overwhelming majority of the 4 million Americans with security clearances are extremely naive in their conceptions of espionage. That is the root of your problem. When I was at TRW, I and several hundred other relatively fresh employees were given a group talk on the perils of espionage. A clean-cut, all-American type addressed us from the podium. Here I sat with the KGB monkey already on my back, surrounded by all these young people who were being fed totally inaccurate and inappropriate descriptions of espionage. They were given the impression that espionage was some exotic, glamorous escapade. Handsome Slav spies would seduce young American secretaries on their vacations in Brussels and bend them into secret agents for the KGB. That type of approach to preventing espionage was and is disastrous. That was just what all those bored young secretaries around me were dying to hear. It was surreal. A government spokesman, automatically accepted by everyone as competent, stood there entertaining all those naive, impressionable youngsters around me with tales of secret adventure, intrigue, huge payoffs, exotic weaponry, seduction, poison, hair-raising risks, deadly gadgetry. It was a whole potpourri of James Bond lunacy when in fact almost everything he said was totally foreign to what was actually happening to me. Where was the despair? Where were the sweaty palms and shaky hands? This man Ned, said nothing about having to wake up in the morning with a gut-gripping fear before stealing yourself once again for the ordeal going back into that vault. 
how could these very ordinary young people not think that here was a panacea that could lift them out of the monotony of their everyday lives, even if it was only in their own fantasies. None of them knew, as I did, that there was no excitement, there was no thrill, there was only depression and a hopeless enslavement to an inhuman, uncaring foreign bureaucracy. I hadn't made myself count for something, I had made my freedom count for nothing. As we sit here, a half dozen, perhaps a dozen, perhaps more Americans are operatives of the KGB. Perhaps some of them have been in place for years. I tell you that none of them are happy men or women. And I would suspect that there are hundreds of other Americans out of the four million with security clearances who have given serious thought to espionage. Those are the people that you must seek out and reach with the truth. It is infinitely better for you to make the extra effort to ensure that your personnel understand beyond a shadow of a doubt how espionage wounds a man than for more and more of them to find out for themselves. No American who has gone to the KGB has not come to regret it. For whatever reason, a person begins his involvement. A week after the folly begins, the original intent and purpose becomes lost in the ignominy of the ongoing nightmare, be it to give your life meaning or to make a political statement, be it to seek adventure or to pay delinquent alimony, be it for whatever reason, see a lawyer or a psychiatrist or a priest or even a reporter, but don't see a KGB agent. That is the solution to nothing. I only wish, Senators, that before more Americans take that irreversible step, that they could know what I now know, that they are bringing down upon themselves heartache more heavy than a mountain. To be sentenced to prison, you, you need to be able to, to at least exist and, and, uh, and not, you know, be murdered. I, the people were being murdered all around me. And uh, it was a regular gladiator school where I was. So I escaped to save my life, and I, it's a story that I wanted to tell. You said in a phone interview on, on CNN that if you had to do it all over again, you wouldn't do it. What changed your mind? The greatest thing that you have uh, in this world is your own life, and uh, my actions caused me to lose uh, a quarter century of my life. Uh, many, many years of that was in solitary confinement, and it was tough. And I don't believe that I could again destroy my own life or such a large segment of it like like I did. It's it's, and that's why I I I I feel so sorry for Manning and Snowden if they ever get him because their life is going to be a living hell. They they they'll have years and years of solitary confinement, and uh, I just don't believe that I could do that to myself again. So you said that you said that you thought you were aiding your country. Bradley Manning said that he was aiding his country as well as Edward Snowden. What would you say now to someone who has access to that sensitive information and they're on the threshold of deciding whether to release it with the thought that they would be aiding their country? What would you tell that person about your own life experience? I would tell them that they ought to go where they're going to stay. Snowden should have went to Venezuela or to Ecuador, not, you know, start off on a junket around the world. Do you support Edward Snowden's actions of releasing the information about the NSA surveillance program? Absolutely. I'm glad he did it. I just wish that he didn't, had not gone to Russia, that he had gone anywhere else but there because I mean, Russia is America's traditional boogeyman, and by going to Russia, he detracts from the message that he was trying to deliver. Kate, you successfully uh, helped uh, Dalton and Chris get out of federal prison. What would your defense be for Edward Snowden? I don't know. I, I wish I could answer that. I'd actually have to sit down and have a long talk with Edward Snowden. 
I believe there has not been enough evidence of damage in either Manning's case or in Snowden's case. And I think that the NSA and the United States government can make up their own stories about damage as much as they want to. I think it's up to the American people to decide that. I happen to support Snowden. I really support Manning. And I, I don't know what their damage assessment is. I don't think any of us do at this point. I read the book, and you write in the foreword, you call yourself uh, a Don Quixote looking for a windmill, that you were destined to have great enemies. Chris, was that maybe the real motivation um, for selling those secrets to Russia about the, the surveillance program in Australia? I mean, that you were, to mix metaphors once again, a David looking for a Goliath, and you decided it would be the U.S. government. I must confess that there you have a you probably hit the nail squarely on the head there. Uh, I was probably looking for any excuse to tilt windmills, and that's a personal flaw I have. I uh, I've certainly burned my fingers doing it, but uh, I was certainly. Uh, moved to do it by what I watched on the Twixes, the encrypted Twixes, about uh, our uh, intervention in Australian domestic politics. But I think you're right. I was, I was looking for windmills and uh, in the process destroyed 25 years of my life.